Good afternoon and welcome to the latest edition of the 18 Bad Guys documentary. I'm delighted this evening to be joined by the only one and only Rodney Salisbury, who played uh, the role in three different A-Team episodes. His first appearance came in Mind Games, uh, Season 4, Episode 9. He was an ambulance attendant. His second episode uh, came in the Season 4, Episode 11, as the character Price in The Doctor Is Out. And his final episode came in Season 5, Firing Line, uh, Episode 3. He played the role as Sergeant Reger. Um, Rodney, I suppose, first of all, welcome. Delighted to have you. And uh, I, I am delighted to be me, here, Jim. And tell me, Rodney, I suppose the A-Team is an iconic sort of franchise. It's known universal. It's shown in so many different languages, so many different countries around the world. It's rerun uh, the whole time. In fact, even speaking to some actors, they even say they're, keep, they're still getting residuals for episodes that they were in uh, the A-Team. For you to be involved and to play a role in that sort of a, a franchise and not to make not one, but three appearances. Uh, does it still, still hold a fun place, fond memories for you? Yes, it does. It definitely does. I had a great time. We shot on great locations, although they were all here um, in Los Angeles. They were in nice areas. It just wasn't on the studio lot. You know, we would travel and be on different ranches and things like that. And that was very nice. And even when we were on the studio lot, that was nice too. But uh, it brings back fond memories. I, I had a great time uh, with the likes of Mr. T. And um, it, it was just, um, the directing was great. Uh, the producer uh, who, uh, who has done many great shows like that, made sure that the actors were very comfortable all the time. And I suppose, Rodney, you mentioned there uh, the producer, Steve Cannell, who's no longer Steve with Cannell. us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, in terms of uh, working uh, under Steve, uh, was he a, a visionary in terms of what he wanted for an, a guest actor coming in? Was he sort of Pacific? Had he a clear sort of idea in his head of how he wanted everything to run? No doubt about it. He was definitely a visionary. And he made you feel like one of the stars, actually. He really did. I mean, there was no separation once you got a role on the A-Team. Um, you were definitely taken care of. If you were in your dressing room, for instance, and you had just gotten your meal, if you had uh, stood online, and of course, as an actor and a guest star or a co-star, you uh, would be in the line and you'd get your food and you'd go back to your trailer. And if they happened to finish a scene early and maybe come to get you, they would get you and there's your food, right? I didn't get to finish my food. Well, when you came back, they made sure that you had hot food uh, ready for you to uh, resume eating. And I suppose, Rodney, one of the things that everyone I've spoken to so far uh, found about the A-Team that they really enjoyed was the stunts in terms of how the, 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 the methods they went in terms of the stunt team that they had working in the A-Team. Everyone said it was uh, first class, the, the stunts that they were able to, pu uh, to pull off at at the time in the 80s was above what was being produced on sort of normal TV. And was that your experience of being on the show? Were you sort of taken back in terms of how much content they were able to put into one episode? I was definitely impressed with that. As a matter of fact, there was a uh, stuntman that always did my stunts. Uh, Joffrey uh, was his name, uh, the late Joffrey. And um, he was also doing them for the A-Team and he did them there. Um, again, everything was precise and to the point and everybody was well taken care of. If there was a stunt that was not safe for an actor, uh, Stephen Canal Productions made sure that there were proper stuntmen. And, and the other thing that was kind of specific about him is this. Um, the stuntman, like, okay, for instance, I'm an African-American, so, yeah. Uh, you might say, well, any, uh, any African-American can do the stunt for this African-American. Well, the nice thing about Stephen Canal uh, Productions was this. Not only did you have an African-American stuntman, but that stuntman could almost be your twin. That's how much he looked like you both uh, physically uh, in the way that you moved and sometimes even facially, even though things were shot quick and uh, at a distance. So again, another precise measure 
by Stephen Canal Productions, um, our stuntmen definitely resembled us. And I suppose uh, the cast of the A-Team, the sort of main cast, uh, in terms of, I suppose, four seasons in, they were probably well-established, they, they were well sort of cohesive unit, but you had sort of real sort of different personalities. You had George Prepared, the real established star. We all remember him from Breakfast and Tiffany's, a big name in the 80s. You had uh, Dur uh, Dirk Benedict Dane coming from the sci-fi sort of world in Battlestar Galactica. You had Mr. T coming from the wrestling world, the entertainment world, the big crossover. But probably the probably one of the most hidden stars of that show was probably Dwight Schultz. He's a theatrical background and his talents were absolutely amazing in terms of acting, in terms of how you go from high to low. And what was your experience of working with all four of them? And do you really feel that uh, Dwight was really a hidden gem in that show? I definitely feel that Dwight was a hidden gem. Uh, you mentioned Dirk, who was quite fun. You know, he was quite, quite a lot of fun. Um, uh, George was as cool as he was in the Tiffany movie. I mean, uh, he, uh, the cigar smoking was, was constant and it always had flair. Um, and when I say constant, it was never during a scene, of course, but in between. Yeah. Um, uh, Dwight was great. Dwight was, was funny. Uh, Dirk was funny. These guys were always hamming it up in between takes, uh, cracking jokes. Again, being nice to everybody, letting everybody in on the joke, uh, sometimes joking with us. There was another actor, I can't think of his name right now, but, um, and I'm sure you've seen some scenes that I did with him. He had, he had dark hair, a dark mustache. What was that guy's name? Uh, uh, was it Frankie Velez? I think it was. I think it was, Frankie. We had a scene uh, when I was showing him, uh, I actually, speaking of smoking, uh, I, I lit his cigarette, for instance, uh, as we, he was dressed in a, um, a priest type uh, get up. Um, yeah. it, it, are we talking think, about the same actor? I think yeah, we're talking yeah, about yeah. Frankie. Yeah, he did costumes. He, he joined roughly in season five. I think that's season five, episode uh, three you're on about there. There you go. What's his nationality? Do you know? Uh, Frankie Velez, he's he's American, but there's uh, there's a tint of uh, Mexican uh, in terms of relatives there. That's him. That's the guy. An another yeah. fun guy. What a great episode. We had a great time. You know, another thing we used to do, too, is we had the ability to uh, improvise and, and maybe add our own things to the situation, which was nice, too. So again, an actor felt good. And this is without even having like a lot of lines. It's not like I came on to these roles with, you know, a whole lot to say. Um, uh, the things that you heard me say, a lot of times were things that I actually came up with, you know, uh, because it was that free willing type of uh, atmosphere where they wanted the most out of the actor. And I suppose, um, Rodney, there was five seasons and what a trend that happened on the A-Team, which happened in the 80s. And I suppose it was a trend in certain TV series that if you get started, say, in an A-Team episode in season one or season two, there was a likelihood come season three or se season four that you get a call from Stephen Cannell and you could come back and play a different role, a different character, even though you're the same person, the same sort of face. I know Jack King did it numerous times. Uh, he played uh, different sort of characters with, the, with throughout the seasons of the A-Team. But now, I suppose, in the 2000s, the late 90s, once you appeared in a TV episode of a series and you played a character, unless that character came back or appeared, the, the likelihood of you coming back again was non-existent. Was that just maybe a trend of the 80s that people could, could, could come back and play multiple roles in terms of being a good guy maybe in season two and being a different bad guy in season four? Was, just, was that just a trend of the times? Well, it was definitely a trend of the times. It was also a testament as to what a good job you did the first time you played a role. And you would almost be a Stephen Canal player at some point, you know what I'm saying? Part of a acting troupe, if you will, that did all of his shows. Uh, you probably could help me better than I remember other Stephen Canal shows that I did. Uh, but I know that that was the case, you know? Um, yeah. 
he was one of the big producers at that time. Um, there are some other names too that you could probably give me, but no doubt about it, once you became part of an ensemble of actors that Steven used, he used you in all of his productions and definitely in the A-Team, as you said, I, I did, what did you say, three or four, which was it? Uh, three episodes. I did three episodes, yeah, there's, there's a perfect example, yes. And I suppose, uh, Rodney, in terms of uh, appearing on the episode and uh, sometimes in relation to a guest, uh, being a guest star and appearing on sort of a bad episode, you might appear as a, a henchman to the main sort of villain as such, and he would be another sort of guest star. In terms of working up a chemistry uh, for that one episode, in terms of uh, meeting that other main sort of villain. How does that sort of work or do you interact or co-act co it to try and sort of give up that sort of unity of bad guys or that unity or is it just he plays his part, you play you, your part and you hope it clicks on, on set? Well, I'll tell you what happens, uh, Jim. Um, acting is a matter of reacting. And so if I'm hired as a bad guy, and uh, I'm speaking with a, another bad guy or a good guy. My reaction is based on what they give me. Now, you might say, well, what if the actor gives you nothing? You know, or what if the actor is a bad actor and, and what they give you doesn't help you respond? Well, that can never be the case because reality is whenever I'm out in public, whenever I'm in, in life, whatever I'm doing, anybody that I am confronting or speaking with is doing something that I have to react to. You see yeah, what I'm saying? I get you. I, I, yeah, so I get you. so if if I'm a bad guy and the reactions that I give are always bad, that's easy to do. I react to whatever you give me and I come back in a bad way. If I'm a good guy, whatever you give me, I come back in a good way. You see, so it's, it's very easy for me to go from character to character based on what my title is uh, out the gate. Bad guy, like you said, good guy. Now I react to what you say or what facial face you make. I react to that in a bad way or a good way based on what I was cast to be. And I suppose that uh, Rodney, I uh, just one of your episodes there in season five as probably one of the most watched episodes of the A team uh, of all time, really. Firing line, where the A team are put on the execution sort of line, and you play Sergeant or Reger. Uh, I suppose that was probably one of the most watched episodes of the A team as such, because the the sort of previous uh, episode and the court case sort of led into it, and it had the hype of all America that the A-team are going to be sort of executed in the sort of next episode. So the TV networks, the ratings at that time, it was all sort of pulling towards that episode. So on set in that sort of episode as such, was that really a sort of, could you feel it was a big sort of episode in terms of what they were trying to do in terms of that episode, given the publicity around it? Um, I must say that when you record these things, even if there is a lot of hype in front of it, you never at that time have any feeling or estimation as to what it will be. I can point out a bunch of other shows that, that, that I have been on uh, and even great uh, uh, movies um, like The Lion King, you know, when I actually <laughs> sang Hakuna Matata and um, and and uh, these things, and and as I'm singing them, I'm not thinking this is going to be real big one day. Well, the same thing was going on with Firing Line. I had no idea that okay. it would be so popular. No, you don't know that at the time. You're just doing your job. And I suppose, uh, Rodney, in terms of seasons go by and sort of decades go by and you see your episodes on tv on multiple channels and every time maybe you're sitting down with family and you're flicking through the channels and the a team sort of comes on do you sort of sit down watching to say to yourself i wonder will this be my episode uh will, the, uh, will i come across this and has it often come to pass that ha that has been the case and for family and friends and loved ones uh 
for for you, I know you've been hundreds of projects, but do, do they all sort of get a sense of enjoyment when they see you on the A-team or when they're watching TV episodes and say, oh, that's my uncle, that's my cousin, that's my grandfather on TV, and especially the younger generation, do they ask you, what was it like meeting Mr. T? So there's a, still a real sort of um, pride still attached for, for everyone closely associated to you. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. You know, my relatives, uh, my nieces and nephews, my new grandson is only a year and some months. So it's too early for him to react that way. But no doubt about it. My, my mother, you know, um, they're always happy to see me on things like taxi and, um, oh, I mean, it, the list goes on, <laughs> you know, all these different shows. And, um, and, and, and yes, um, I actually bump into these things. You know, MASH, for instance, um, is another one of these shows that the nostalgia is so strong. And, and it's just like you are here with the A-Team. There's constant interviews and there's constant uh, remembrance of, of this great show. So yes, you, you're right. All of these things sort of uh, uh, culminate together and they always come up. And uh, what's old really is new. And it's actually more popular than some of the new stuff. And you mentioned that, Rodney, in terms of the popularity of the TV series back in the 80s. And such was its popularity that actually when the AT movie came out, say, in early 2000, they came to skating uh, reviews in terms of God, that it went so far away from the actual original. It changed the script to Iraq and uh, Afghanistan and uh, these soldiers trying to escape the Taliban and stuff like that, that it sort of, they tried to make a, a, a take away from what was already a really good sort of, I suppose, promise or team around the sort of A team. So I suppose the A team has such a global audience, it's such a fan base that if you try and touch something like that, that is goal really in terms of cult classic series, uh, in terms of making a, a new pro project project of it or a new version of it, that you really have to connect with it, the soul of the project and connect with the original fan page. Or if, if you don't meet their uh, expectations, they'll turn against it very fairly quick. Let me say this. The term less is more hmm. has never been more evident than in these remakes. If you remake it, do it the way it was, you know, yeah. don't, don't make all these changes. Um, whatever you do in life, less is more. Now, what do I mean by that? Of course, we have to prepare and we have to work hard and we have to do our due diligence and we have to try to be the best that we can be. But if you're, you know, uh, acting, you know, the, 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 the actor, that is more successful, is more laid back, is more natural. Everything has to be natural. And so when you remake a classic, you need to stick with the real deal. You know what I mean? Stick with what's yeah. there, maybe expand just a little bit because the reason you like it so much and the reason that you want to do it over again is because of how good it was the first time. And so yeah. uh, that's what I would say, less is more, just do what they did, that's all you gotta do. I remember watching uh, Michael Jackson in um, this last uh, movie that they did, um, This Is It. And he yeah. was talking to the uh, piano player as they were trying to play, um, I think it's uh, The Way You Make Me Feel. And the piano player was trying to do all these things and Mike said, hey, look, do it exactly the way the record is. Do it like yeah. that. You know, you got to feel it, you know. Um, I've become quite popular on TikTok, right? You're familiar with that? Yeah, and I'm part of it, the younger generation, yeah. There you go. And, and, and so they say the younger generation, but how can a guy like me be popular on TikTok? Well, because I am being me and yeah. I am doing what comes natural. And I can never figure out what's going to be something that will go viral when I'm doing it. I'm just doing what I want to do and I like it. And if I like it, that's a great start. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the things that end up going viral, I'm like, I'm shocked. You know, why did that go? Why did that go? Well, it's one reason it went. And one reason why anything works is because 
you didn't oversell it. You didn't push yeah. it too hard. You just did it. And I suppose, uh, Rodney, uh, lastly, before I let you go, and I suppose you have uh, so many sort of fond memories uh, throughout your career, career, being involved in so many different sorts of projects as well. I suppose it's hard really to ask you this question to sort of condense your time uh, on the A-team. But if someone said to you, if you could sum up your experiences of the A-team and what was it like to be on that set, and someone said, right, Rodney Salisbury, you were on the A-team, you played a role in three, di uh, three different episodes. If I could ask you now in two sentences to write down what that felt like, what would you like those two sentences to read? The two sentences would read like this. When I went to work in the morning for the A-team and I stood in that line and got my breakfast burrito. Yeah, that's where I first learned about a breakfast burrito on movie sets, on television sets. And it's the best in the world. You've never had a breakfast burrito like you get off of a truck on a movie yeah. set. Okay, so two lines, the greatest breakfast burritos and the friendliest cast in television. Uh, on that note, uh, Rodney Salisbury, an absolute pleasure talking today to relive your memories of your time played in the A-team. Your first episode appeared in season four, episode nine, Mind Games, you played an amb ambulance attendant. Your second episode, The Doctor is Out, season four, you, uh, episode 11, you played the role of Price. And your final episode, season five, episode three, Firing Line, you played the role of Sergeant Reacher. And I suppose such was your success, Rodney, that so many people people have only appeared once in the A-team. You got to appear three times. So it was a testament to you and your acting that you got it. You did the job good each time that they wanted you to, to come back more. No doubt if there was a season six or a season seven, you would have been invited back to that as well. But we got the five seasons. We got to enjoy them. And we got a great experience to, uh, and a great chat with you today, Rodney. And we wish you a prosperous uh, 2021 with this uh, global pandemic. Ends. Take care, Rodney Salisbury. Thank you so much. I had a great time and goodbye to everybody. Everybody be healthy, be safe, and be prosperous. Take care, Rodney. Take care.